you. Is the sound picking up okay on the um, the live stream? Uh, I don't hear any sound on the live stream at the moment. Let me check my volume settings. Is there picking up okay on the, um, the live stream? It just started coming through now with a bit of a delay. Okay. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to mute the teleconference call for me. Um, but if you want to interrupt and ask questions, the, the live stream delay is about 10 to 15 seconds. Um, but if you want to interject at some point, okay? okay? So I'm going to mute it if you, um, okay. right now. Okay. Did somebody just join? Hi, Dan. I'm just letting you know that, um, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to mute my phone so that, um, you can, uh, so that you don't hear double on the YouTube live stream with this, but you can interrupt at any point. Um, just bear in mind there's going to be a 10 to 15 second delay on the live stream, okay? Okay, so you're going to mute. Um, you're really, really quiet on, uh, on YouTube for me. I've got you maxed out, so, okay. I am? Okay. Thank you for letting me know here. Uh, let me see what I can Is that any better? That sounds good. Okay. Um, as I said um, in the chat, we're just waiting a few minutes. I'm sorry for being late, but we got... That sounds much better. Yes. Okay. Did everybody get the handout uh, for the um, the class in the email?
Thank you, brother. I'll just start over. Is that okay, brothers? Okay. In the second year of a novice's life, the novelty has worn off. The excitement of joining the Brotherhood has faded. The office hopefully has become familiar to you. The apostolate, uh, whether or not it's brand new or you're still working towards it, um, the initial excitement of it uh, gives way to the reality of the grind. As such, many people struggle in their second and third years of the novitiate. This book, in particular, deals with that reality that after the initial uh, light coming into our life and illumining the darkness around us, that initial fire of grace, that it begins to fade with the reality of the uh, our continual capitulations to temptations, our lack of zeal, um, the sinfulness of those around us scandalizing us and getting us to give up. And as such, um, that's why we're going to be using this book. With the greatest efforts, with the greatest zeal, we can still be defeated by our enemy. And that is why David, even though he um, he was, uh, when he fought Goliath, he did not overcome Goliath by uh, his strength, nor did he overcome Goliath by his armor, which he actually declined to use because it did not fit him. He overcame Goliath through wisdom, a wisdom that was infused by fidelity to his duties as a shepherd, um, and through those continual and repeated actions that he did with the most purest intention. That was by watching after the flock, he had learned a skill of warfare, which was to uh, be able to sling rocks particularly well. And so he approached his battle with wisdom, with faith, and with confidence in God, and as such, quickly defeated Goliath uh, that could hitherto not be defeated, and not only did he defeat him, but he made a trophy of his head by decapitating him and showing him to all uh, of the, the church or the, the chosen people, right, uh, as a sign of triumph over the enemy. And so that is the same thing that a novice we want to enable you to do, that not only through your fidelity, continual fidelity to the rule, it will prepare you for the conflict with the world, but that your victory will be so total that you will show the world as you triumph over it a trophy, a sport, um, that you slay uh, this enemy, which is the world, the flesh, and the devil before you. And um, you do it both to the astonishment of those around you and uh, for the, uh, the strengthening of the church. And with that... Uh, that is why we are reading the book. Now, I'd like to talk about how I would like you to read the book. There are books of study which uh, we can pick up from beginning to end and read and absorb their ideas. That would be like a book on dogmatic theology. There are books that are um, a great reference material um, that we can consult when we have a difficult spiritual question. And we might just look up a particular section in it, like The Spiritual Life by Tom Carey, The Evergatinos, or anything of that sort. Then there are books which, in this case, it both provides a study of a topic and it provides <coughs> fodder in each chapter for consideration. And these books need to be read slowly, carefully, and that while they're not necessarily a book for mental prayer, they are a book that's meant to be read in that type of spirit. They're a book that invites us to an examination of ourselves, uh, a self-critique, and also um, it provides us topics to bring up in the context of confession and in spiritual direction. And that is the manner in which I would like you to read this book. So I do not particularly want you to read ahead. Rather, I would like you to read the book slowly and with an eye towards identifying those areas within yourself that uh, you can bring up with your spiritual director or with your novice master, depending on 
if it's an exterior matter or an interior matter, and that way you can benefit the most by it. If you were to just sit down and read it and, and rock it out, um, it would not necessarily benefit you. In fact, it could discourage you. Last, there's uh, the, the author is approaching this topic from the point of view that you are already very devout. If you are reading the book and you feel convicted due to your true and sincere humility that you come up way too short of the mark to read this book, I would encourage you to not have such feelings, but just to rather view it as uh, receiving an abundance of light and grace at once and set upon yourself the duty of picking out one thing and then continually working on it. So do not be overwhelmed no matter where you're at in reading this book. It, all of you, I know everybody here, have been practicing the spiritual life for a number of years at this point, and you are prepared to read this text and to struggle with it. If anything, if we're reading a text and we're not struggling with it, then we're reading a child's book for us. We, we should not feel, as we read spiritual books, that we measure up. If we, and if we do measure up, then it's time to put that down and pick up something harder. Okay. The first chapter talks about true signs of progress in the spiritual life. And it points out that we can never know if we're even in a, a, a state of grace. But that there are five signs that we can have that um, whether or not we are making any progress. And the first one is if we are discont discontent with our present self and that we desire to be better for God. The second is that if we are always making new beginnings and fresh starts. The third is if we have a definite thing in view of growing in a virtue or overcoming a sin and that we constantly strive after that matter. The fourth is that if we feel strong inclinations towards a particular thing or mission, though it explicitly mentions that this is not necessary and in particular it may not occur in a religious superior and finally, if we just have a general desire to become perfected, this doesn't necessarily mean to become, um, it doesn't mean that our general desire is some type of vague, I wish to be as holy as, as the saints in some unreal way, but we have a real desire to be perfected, to be uh, chiseled upon. When we're reading this, the discontentness that we should feel and our desire to be better towards God, because our way is particular, because we are not just some layman who doesn't know his destiny yet, is that we want to be, um, we are discontent with our observance of the rule. Bringing you back to the ideas laid out by um, Tonkere in the spiritual life, it says that for religious, or for somebody who professes a rule, that our perfection lies in the perfect living out of the rule. So it is a good thing, then, if we are not content with our own observance of the rule. Now this disgust has to be an interior disgust. It should not be directed towards our brothers in the rule, unless our brothers are failing to ex observe the exterior aspects of the rule that are clearly defined. But the perfection that exists within the rule like the total denial of self, that is not our domain for correction with them. Nor is it my domain in correction as being your novice master to outline how, unless you concretely ask me, how can I perfectly observe? But in your particulars of the, ex of the complete self-denial, that is something that I can only kind of comment on if I'm invited to. And then it only really works well if, it, or works better like here for Will, who I at least see uh, daily <laughs> most of the time, rather than if I don't see you that frequently. On making new beginnings and fresh starts, that applies most broadly, and it applies most particularly to sin. We should all be going to confession frequently. We all have the same sins probably that we struggle with. Or perhaps we experience the same temptations even if we don't capitulate to voluntary, deliberate sins. And as such, it is in that that we should be making 
new beginnings and fresh starts. As novices, you should not be capitulating to your prayer rules. You should be keeping those steadfastly. And if it becomes habitual that you are not keeping your prayer rule and you feel unable to, that is the sign that, that you perhaps are not called to um, move forward anymore with your novitiate. Um, but uh, that, of course, is a topic to talk about in private. But that the, the fresh starts have to be viewed not in a failure of exterior observances, but in our failures, our personal failures of sin. The third is that we have a definite thing in view. Okay, all of us should have a definite thing in view. And that is our perfection in the rule, our perfect living out of the order or of the mission of the order. Any one of those things would suffice for the third. And then the strong inclination towards a particular thing or mission, that would be your most of the time either how you intend to be interior perfected, since that is the primary end of our brotherhood, or your particular apostolate. And finally, the desire to become perfected, the very fact that you're here, you all have that already. So the author, when he approaches this, he's saying that he's asking, he's inviting the reader to examine themselves. But by the second chapter, he very much seems like, okay, now that you've examined yourself, I've assumed you've picked up all four, at least all four of these. Maybe not the, the, the particular mission, but everything else, he's assuming that now you've examined yourself, you've found a way to those five ends. And then he says, but what about and then the second chapter of presumption and discouragement as being these two toxic things that can greatly harm us. In fact, the two worst things that can harm us. And discouragement is an inclination to give up all attempts at the devout life. For us, and then of course he says it renders us languid and unjoyous. So for us, discouragement is when we do not feel that we can perfectly or ever come to the perfect living out of the rule. It's really that simple. And one of those signs of discouragement is to say things like, this was written for monks, not for laymen. Or uh, this, was, this is uh, old language, or it's written in the la language of the gospel, and the gospel is out of reach, so therefore, because it's out of reach, I don't ever have to try. It's like in the modern world, where it's common today, this notion that um, people throw around these um, terms of collective guilt, like calling everybody in a group racist by nature of their birth. It's just a concrete example. And then because everybody views themselves as out as this thing, then there's actually no practical way to even overcome it, right? So we actually have to view the rule in its perfection as something concrete that is suggested to us, not as a gospel maxim that's out of our reach. Perfect self-denial is obtainable. It's a process to obtain it, but it is obtainable, and it's obtainable in this life. Though God may make us say many prayers and suffer very much to obtain to the thing that we desire in the degree that we should desire it, which is, as it says in the rule, right, that one day we'll be compared with the wisest of prophets. Okay. Presumption. That is giving up on mortification and viewing that grace should make all our actions easy. Now, one thing that um, I will mention here, and this is the author's point of view, is that grace is always readily, that God gives us abundant grace and that it's always readily available. And I understand his point of view. I would not choose to express it that way. It is important to remember that grace is not, what well, God is so generous and um, uh, with his giving of favor and grace, it's important to remember that God does choose to withhold grace all the time. He allows people to be hardened in their sins like the Pharaoh, he explicitly states that certain people are cursed, like Judas, and that um, in uh, 1 John, um, it even warns about mentioning certain people in front of God, and that in the lives of the saints, for example, in the life of St. Columba, he uh, explicitly said that if a man 
commit lapse into sin again, that God would curse him and he'd never, he'd die in his sins. And it did happen as he pro- professed. And then the blessed, a life of blessed Anna Maria Taiji. Um, she once set about praying for a, a reprobate and um, God told her that he would not hear her prayers and he'd make sure of it. And so she couldn't, she literally would keep forgetting to pray for him until he died in his sins. So we should never have a cheap view of grace. And uh, while I understand, like I said, I understand what he's saying as you read the chapter. From my point of view is that um, while we can, we should never presume that God is giving us the things that we're praying for. Rather, if we're not living out the things we're praying for, his example is getting up out of bed in the morning. We should ask ourselves, Am I committing some sin? Am I failing in some duty that would make God say, no, I will not give you this thing that you asked for, this lesser grace? Am I committing some bigger sin? And then we have to sit down and do the hard work of examination. That's the thing about prayers is that prayers should be answered. And so when God doesn't answer our prayers or doesn't appear to be answering our prayers, then we should sit down and say, something has caused a problem here. <laughs> With that being said, uh, never get discouraged on praying for good things because it can take years for God to like make those good things happen <laughs> too. <laughs> anyway. So five uncertain signs of progress. He says, one is trying to discern whether we do or do not conquer a fault. Um, he says that we very much need to wait a long time before making this conclusion. And um, uh, I completely, you know, agree with that. And so we never are really quite secure. And in fact, when we once again look at um, the totality of what the saints did, and we see that their carefulness almost increases with time, not diminishes in time. Although there are exceptions to that rule. Um, like St. Alphonsus, for example, he, he played the harp as a child, because he was forced to. And then later when he became a religious, he thought it was the greatest waste of time on earth and that he regretted it deeply. And he railed against it. Not railed, that's maybe too strong, but he was very much against it. And then as an older man, when he was retired, he lived with seminarians as a retired bishop. He used to play the harp for them at recreation and it used to delight him very much, their happiness. So that's a great example of... <laughs> him viewing it as this recreation was a waste of time to later it being an exercise of charity. So that's kind of the, the other side of it. But um, we never really uh, know if we conquered a fault. At the other end of the spectrum, there was the great story from the Desert Fathers about a uh, priest. Um, I believe he was forced to take a wife for some reason, but he lived in complete continence and he would not look at her. And then even as he was dying... Uh, she came in to show him some kindness and he sent her away because he said that the wood is dry and um, even your touch might ignite the fire, right? And so he, that was an example of a man who increased his his carefulness over the years with um, because of his desire to be continent. So uh, next is when we become disheartened because we feel no devotion or sweetness in spiritual things or exercises. As we say the office, which is our greatest work in particular, we should never feel that even if we say or sing the Latin perfectly, even if at times we feel like we're in the seventh heaven, if we sat in the prayer and we had extreme dryness in it, that somehow our prayer was unacceptable to God. Nor should we, at the other end of the spectrum, view that if we experience tremendous dryness, rather I would encourage you, as these feelings come and go, if they any feeling persists for a long time, that is when you should bring it up and possibly depending on what the cause of it is, I mean, with either me or with your spiritual director. It's only when a feeling persists for a very long time. If you go back and forth between consolation and non-consolation, then that's normal and you're just experiencing the normal flow. It's when you begin going one direction and it's that way all the time, unbroken, then you should bring it up. 
because it's unnor it's not normal to always be floating in heaven during the ves uh, during vespers or lauds or something nor is it normal to always feel complete desolation and dryness the third uh, drawing spir spiritual conclusions from mental prayer either becoming easier or harder Mental prayer, a lot of it has to do with the minds of the individuals. It should be something we are all practicing every day if possible. And as such, you can't... It's, it's definitely an area of... only thing I would caution to add to that is that the worst spiritual delusions can happen in the context of mental prayer. Especially when people use images in their mind and just to be on guard about that. Having a good imagination does not mean that a person's made good progress. And at the other end of the spectrum too, a person who does tremendous violence to themselves during mental prayer can actually be of great penance. If, for example, they have a mind that won't stop working or, um, or they just find abandoning vocal prayer and trying to think on a topic to be particularly hard to them. To philosophize on temptations, and either to become elated or cast down, depending on their strength or weaknesses. I don't really have anything to add to what the author says for us as knights. It's a very broad um, category. Only thing I would say is that as novices is to have a great humility when approaching failures to the rule and bringing it up with your novice master or other knights or, or your spiritual director, just don't think you necessarily have it figured out. Rather, if you believe you know why a certain temptation or failure is happening, to lay out the, flat, the, the facts plainly, but very much leave it to their judgment. And once again, with temptations you should never bother philosophizing on a minor matter like a deliberate venial sin that's not a frequent occurrence for you thinking deeply on why you fall into repeated and predominant faults can be helpful but it's actually more helpful when they're brought to a director or to a confessor or to your or to me depending on if it's a if it's an exterior thing finally drawing conclusions from the strength of the reception of the sacraments in our lives we all know that feel great feelings or even great uh periods of peace in our things are gifts that god gives as he feels the necessity to give them What's important as knights, as laymen with other pew sitters, so to speak, is that we always be a model of steadfastness, constancy, and courage, especially in the reception of the sacraments. We don't want to be the people who come and go from church or observances as we see fit. And um, because what will happen is, is that if we follow after not only our heart, does our religion became it, our religion becomes a very bad example towards others, especially in light of our vow. And so, even if we feel that the sacraments are hurting in a sense us, or we feel greatly cast down, we should just remind ourselves that the rule says that we should partake of them as frequently as possible, and that we have to go to confession for our faults. And we should not allow the devil to lie to us and say that somehow that we can, through some other way, find a greater spiritual direction than seeking after these things. The next chapter is how to make the most of our signs of progress. And he points out that the counter to recollection, I mean, uh, presumption and discouragement are recollection and fidelity. Recollection is the double attention which we pay first to God and then to ourselves. It must come without great strain. 
and it must be as uninterrupted as possible. Now this is where a lot of people might get discouraged. This book was written in 1863, and today we live in an environment of electronic distraction where I can't even go to the grocery store without having pop music blared into my ears. Um, and we have jobs that require us to have our cell phones on all the time. But if all those things exist, God also, if we ask him for it in prayer, can still give us the grace of recollection. And we can, we also have means that we never had before. So for example, um, like listening to audiobooks in the car that are of a religious nature, or the fact that even on my cell phone, I can go read the fathers at a break when that was never available before, unless somebody carried around books with them. And so we have to use our own modern solutions to the modern problem of a lack of silence and a lack of freedom from care, where a man seems to have less of himself to himself. And we also also have to, once we've come to an agreement with who we live with in a common life, to have a certain amount of time for our own prayer, we have to very much insist upon it. Not to the detriment of care of others, but we reach things by a pleasant agreement and we pleasantly remind people of our need for those things if we have to. And then on this idea of recollection not coming great strain, if we set about this work, or we haven't set about this work, then at our next retreat, when we take a day away or two days, which the rule requires, that should be our primary goal is to re-recollect ourselves. If we find ourselves getting out of a habit of recollection, then that's worth adding things like holy hours or even grouping hours of the office together and making our primary intention just being with God and in his presence. Even if all we are is in his presence, if we feel like we're great sinners and we just say to God something like, Lord, thou knowest that I am dust and ashes, and I will walk before you on my belly, or I will, I will prostrate myself until you lift me up. If we feel that we're great sinners, still, it's better to feel that you're a great sinner before God than it is to not be aware of his presence. I mean, that is a mercy even that we got in the, when we fell in the garden, is that God went seeking us out, calling our name. Rather than hiding ourselves, we should just own up to, you know, whatever sins and humble ourselves and, and go before him again. And if it's because we've grown quite a bit and, and there are many good things in our lives, but we just become too absorbed in the world, like the, the tree that grew up but was strangled by the weeds, then we just have to set about sitting down and being really honest with ourselves. What weed do we pull out first? We may not be able to uproot them all at once. But if we, the second we start pulling one out at a time, we'll, we'll start getting the recollection back because just like the prodigal son, once he turned back home, the father ran out to meet him halfway. And finally, recollection is only acquired by degree, so don't be overly concerned if, if where you're at is just kind of an intellectual awareness that God is everywhere. But you keep that intellectual awareness in your mind. Or like before you do any action, you go, is this a sin or not a sin? That, that suffices for recollection. I mean, it's better if you walk around feeling, or not feeling, but being deeply aware in your heart of hearts that Christ is your brother and you do everything for his pleasure. Um, or that you're deeply aware of the presence of your guardian angel and you know that he has a notebook and he's keeping watch over everything. I mean, that's better, but that only comes by degrees and as a, it's a grace. But it's such a desirable grace if you don't have it. That's definitely something to pray for and to ask for frequently, especially in your office. Fidelity is our faithfulness to our daily prayer rule and to our rule in general. Now, he talks about how people form these obligations of the heart 
for example, some people have a devotion they've kept since their childhood. Maybe they wear the brown scapular. Or maybe it's a it's a corporal work of mercy, like they always visit their elderly aunt once a month or something. But it almost creates a rule. And that's why it's very important as novices, whatever good you were doing before, if you can, keep doing it now, unless it comes in direct conflict with the rule. But that knights aren't obliged to give up anything as long as it doesn't interfere with our rule. And new obligations of the heart can come about through providential circumstances for us. And that's also why one day when you may be superiors in this brotherhood, that when brothers feel an obligation of the heart, that you listen very carefully and that you not just come in and say something to the effect of, oh, well, we want you to do this now, so just shove this thing down. Because it may very well be through providence that God has arranged for that brother to do this, this matter. So fidelity must be seen both in the direct legal sense of our rule and in the sense of viewing our life as a whole through providence. And, um, of course, we don't really know if we have fidelity until God tests us. When we don't want to say the office and we do, or when it's particularly difficult. When we have to get something done for our apostolate and it involves great sacrifice to us. When we may have to uh, do an obligation of obedience just because that's what the community is doing and it's going to make us suffer. However, I will add that one of the things we do receive by being in this brotherhood that other laymen do not have, because of our vow of obedience, we have a freedom. And so when we are going to suffer greatly, we can go to our superior and we can say, here is my dilemma, or this will make me suffer greatly and I'm afraid to do it because I don't want to presume upon strength that I may not have. And then if our superior says, I want you to try, then we can go forward with his blessing, with great confidence and strength that God has will give us the strength to see it through, or at least if we fail because we genuinely run out of strength, that at least we failed in humility. And if the superior then looks at us and says, no, I don't think you should do this because it'll overwhelm you. Then we've won a crown of humility and we may have even received a greater grace than the other matter because it is a hard thing for men to humble themselves before other men. So we enjoy the freedom that laymen do not have to go to a brother and say, here is my situation. Please give me your blessing. Please give me your advice and help me. So what can be done to cultivate these two things? That is recollection and fidelity. The author suggests that we do one more thing for God, that it's concrete and that it's perpetual, whatever our situation is right now, to do one more thing for God. Now, knights already do quite a bit. But there's always something small we can do. At the, our last retreat with the Carmelite Hermit, uh, he suggested that every morning, or that he just told us, he didn't suggest it, but he told us that every morning and every night before they go to bed, that Carmelites kiss the ground and remember their death and then remember their, their dust. It made a very big impact on me when he said that. But that's a perfect thing of one small thing you could do for the rest of your life. That small act. Or perhaps you can make the sign of the cross more frequently and at many times in the day. Or you could put up a holy water fountain by your door. It could be also a good work that you feel like you are inclined to do. Or perhaps you have received a signal grace that is an inclination to do a good thing for a very long time. And you've put it off. You could be resolved to do that. He says, can we put a greater interior spirit into something that we are currently doing? This is great subject for meditation in your daily mental prayer, or even while you say long prayers or at mass. To ask yourself, is there something I can do with greater purity of intention? Can I begin to look at work as a punishment for my sins, for example? Can I 
by God's blessing or thank him after um, each uh, a after particular actions that I do or do not do? Can I see God struggling with me or, uh, or beseeching God for graces in the garden when after I, I lapse into some fault and then I tr try to resume? Can we start praying for a desire for perfection or for perfection itself? One of the beautiful things about the Psalter is that there are many prayers for perfection within it. We just have to unite our heart to them while we say the words. And so we can't avoid praying for perfection unless we literally say the words of the Psalter in ignorance of what they're saying. Or we say to God, no, I really don't want that as we say the psalm. But all we have to do is unite our hearts to those psalms and we are praying for perfection. Are we resting only in pursuit of the service of God? Is everything we do, even the mundane, have at its root the desire for the glory of God? Um, it's, this is a very hard one to examine because we probably all have matters that we do, little things we hold on to, maybe. But what we can do with this is... Um, start to align in our mind that our true rest comes from all the things that we know that God has positively blessed. And in his positive blessing, there is a fulfillment of the enjoyment of those things. Now this speaks to the interior spirit, but when we begin to understand this as it should be, for example, um, everyone here save our brother Will is married. God desires that we love our wives. He's commanded us to love our wives. And so we can delight that in loving our wives, we fulfill a commandment of God. And there's never a fear of that unless in somehow in our common life with our wives, there's some type of, you know, selfish abuse of, of her, you know, like, I don't know. I mean, it, uh, this is a hard example because all of them seem quite, you know, I mean, I guess if you like lo thought you were somehow loving your wives by being a total slob and throwing all your laundry on the floor, unless you were helping her grow in obedience or something, I don't know. But um, uh, that's an example of something we have a blessing from God on. So if we start aligning our mind correctly, just like there's a freedom that I know that God every day has blessed me going to Vespers, I never have to sit down and like have some interior warfare about, well, is it good for me to go to Vespers or should I be doing something else with my time? I don't have to worry about that. God has explicitly given me his blessing to live this way. And same thing with every hour of the office I've said, every time I do my mental prayer, every time I sit down and do my apostolate, every time I correct my children, every time I play with my children, every time I do catechism right, I've all received his explicit blessing for these things. And as such, I don't just sit down and fret about them, but rather all I only have to ask myself is going, am I doing these things for God's perfect glory or in them am I seeking myself? And then we just start gradually removing the self. You know? Anyway. Okay. And then are we pursuing with virtue, with humility, can we stop measuring the ground that we have walked on? Can we humbly admit that the sins and vices we have committed, we remain surrounded by? I don't know that really much has to be said about this other than that, when we fully embrace the motto of our order, then we doing everything for God and so everything belongs to him. And so we don't have to worry about anything so long as we constantly give God everything we've got. And if we fail to give God everything we got, then we can give him those sins that we failed to give him. And then we've given him everything we've gotten. And thus we can find our courage again. And then we don't worry about the rest of it. We don't, it, to the extent that's possible, we just don't worry about how much progress I've made. Um, only in the sense of, am I keeping the rule? Am I living a pleasing life to God? Am I doing what my superiors have told me to do?
And it's and the, as far as the last one goes, um, to the extent that we don't acknowledge that sins and vices always remain with us, will be the extent that we continue to put us into those um, situations that cause us to lapse into sin. And so I will only add that we really do have to pray for a hatred of sin, and we have to pray for a hatred of those particular sins that we feel ourselves most inclined to. The spirit in which we serve God. Nothing is more awful than having to deal with God. And what he means by that, the author, is that God is so terrible in his brilliance, his presence, his power, and he provides many examples from Holy Scripture, that to deal with God is the most fearful thing you can possibly imagine. In fact, it's so fearful that when souls that are damned go to judgment, that they'd rather run headlong into the abyss than to have to continue to gaze at God angry at them. Such is how horrible it is to deal with God in his anger. But even in our own lives, the very fact that God, for example, comes to us in Holy Communion is a terrible thing that God's going to actually judge us on the manner and reception fervor in which we receive that. So he wants us to examine the Spirit in light of God's awful power with these five tests. Is the service of God our most important work, if not our soul work? And does our current life or past life reflect this reality? God loves a cheerful giver. And as a result of that love of a cheerful giver, somebody who constantly resolves to serve God with absolute fervor and as his most important work, even if he falls into stupid sins constantly, um, God seems to bless this in the most wonderful abundance. But to people who think they can somehow be clever with God, he seems to really frustrate them. Um, we all see this in the, the world, even amongst people who are frequent in spiritual exercises, that they can figure out a way to not make God still their most important work. I think collectively we can see even a spirit in the church that we have to be wary of, where God can become displaced in the service of God by a desire for human harmony amongst all people at all times, which is impossible. And so it's something I think on particular to be on guard of that the service of God being our own salvation and the salvation of everybody that we meet and around us is our primary work, not harmony with them. And that that's going to manifest itself in very concrete behavior. And we should be wary of anybody who would take us away from that behavior. So that's, I, I think, um, don't let somebody convince you otherwise. It's my only statement to add is that um, I think it's something we have to be particular on guard of because harmony amongst humans is uh, not, um, it, it, it displaces God if, it, if it's not rooted in harmony found in the common proclamation, belief, and service of the gospel. Finally, do we serve God entirely without reserve? Do we give him all? Now, once again, any of us who have a spiritual director or a novice master, because we're in obedience, if we truly desire to be obedient, then you have you can actually truthfully say, yes, I have given all. Because obedience adds a freedom to know that as long as you serve God completely in the obedience, that it is a martyrdom. It's only when we don't want to serve God in obedience that we can start to say, well, no, that I'm reserving something for myself. I know, for example, if I went down this afternoon and asked my spiritual director, or I wrote a letter to the Grand Master and I said, I want to sell everything that I own, and I want to live on the streets with my family so I could give all to the poor. They would both look at me with horror and think that I had lost my wits about me, and they would not bless such a thing. 
But a man in obedience, in a sense, has already done that. Because he says he's willing to do it. Abraham and Isaac is one of the best stories to understand this obedience. In that Abraham loved Isaac, his son, but that out of obedience to God, he was willing to kill him. He was willing to sacrifice him with his own hand. And so that is how we know that we've given God all. Is that that disposition of I would be willing to do anything if I was asked to do it, if God told me to do it. Now with that being said, the more extreme the action, the more we need, in a sense, proof that it's God, not the devil, our human spirit, some megalomaniac telling us to do it. And God provides signs for those circumstances. But that's one of the, once again, that's one of the freedoms that we receive in a vow of obedience. It's one of the reasons why you should have a great desire to have a vow of obedience in this order. Because we can truly say then, I know that if I'm told to do this, then I will do it. Then I've given all to God. Number three, is our ruling passion for living horror of sin, even venial sin, and to root out all imperfections? That's just a yes or no. And if the answer is no, it's not right now, then we ask for it. It's a great grace. It's a grace rooted in the final grace of perseverance and repentance. And by the way, any type of step, if, for example, let's say that we were trying to move ourselves to be near the sacraments and we, our mind was very fixated on doing that because we knew that good things would happen as a result of that sacrifice, then that also suffices as kind of fighting that ruling passion. That's a concrete step. And so that's what we really want to look for when we're examining this is, am I taking concrete steps to overcome this ruling passion, this, this cause of sin? Am I striving after that? If the answer is no, I'm not doing anything, then you need to start. And that would be, in fact, that would be my number one thing for you on your next spiritual direction would be, here's my ruling passion, and I'm not fighting it. I'm just giving in, you know, not even trying. Um, I, need, I need to start somewhere. Help me. Four, do we avoid slovenliness in all our dealings with God? I mean, this is actually quite a simple one. I mean, if we're lying in bed, saying the office with one hand, uh, you know, or, you know, uh, we only read the Bible when we're most comfortable with our feet up and a drink. If we only will do our mental prayer sitting in the church, never kneeling. If um, we take every pain to avoid high mass, but want to go to the short or low mass, if, um, you know, we only will uh, hear Mass after we've had, you know, uh, if we made sure we got eight hours. I mean, these, this kind of explains itself. We have began to lost the fear of God, and he goes into great dealings with those signs of it. And all I can say is, if that's happened, just remember that that has a word for it. It's despondency, and it never leaves you. And if that's a particular problem for you, then I'd highly recommend getting the book, The Latter Divine Ascent, and reading the chapter on despondency by St. John Climaticus, and feel encouraged because he points out that this is more or less a problem in every monk's life until he dies. Just if despondency was a demon, it would be massive and black, it'd look like a serpent, it'd be ten times your size, and it'd have a gold stripe in it. The gold stripe would represent luxury because that's what slovenliness represents, is some type of pleasure-seeking in the service of God. And its massive size represents its ability to absolutely choke out any human being, except, of course, our Lord and Our Lady, which it has no hold over. But everybody else, it can easily conquer them, easily conquer them, if it just give in. By the way, the second you resolve at prayer to basically suffer and be uncomfortable, you've just dealt despondency a fatal blow. 
And the second we resolve that come hell or high water, we will do something at the time it's meant to be done, you've just beaten it back. And by the way, Climaticus has great descriptions of, like, he actually says at one point, I think, like, and the monk who does this decapitates his enemy and buries it in the desert or something like that. It's it's quite wonderful. So if this is an area that you struggle with, don't lose courage. Just realize that it's something that every devout person has to struggle with. But don't be one of those insufferable weenies who somehow thinks that the fact you've lost your fear of God means that you've obtained a perfect love. And that now, because, you know, we're best friends, you and God, that you get to act without fear in his holy presence. Yikes. I mean, that is exact. I mean, it's just too much mysticism on the cheap nowadays. Watching a bunch of fat priests talk on a live stream about how we should, how, you know, love casts out fear or something. And you're looking at it going, that doesn't look like, you know, I, I think I'll take my counsel somewhere else. Be mindful of it. Okay, anyway. And then finally, are we honestly serving God? Do we have a spirit of generosity and self-sacrifice? Do we exclude anything in the service of God, whether imaginary or uh, relevant? And this is very, very important. Look into the lives of the saints. Pick out any story of martyrdom you want. And ask yourself, if God asked me to do this, would I say yes? If you can find a single instance where you would say, no, I would not do that, then you more or less do not love God and you've broken your baptismal promises. Look into the lies, look into any horrible crime you can imagine and ask yourself two questions. If I committed this crime, would I honestly confess it and repent of it? And the second question is, if I was falsely accused of this crime and was sentenced justly to death or shame, would I accept it? If the answer is not yes to both of those, then you've made an idol out of something. You've made an idol out of yourself and your own pride, and you don't love God. If you sat down and asked your question, if your religious superior asked you to do something that was not a sin, but be greatly inconvenient to you, or took something away from you unjustly, would you accept it and move on with your life? And the answer is not yes, and you have a massive problem. There's nothing, nothing. And once again, back to that example of Abraham and Isaac, that God can ask us to do that we can't say yes to. I will do that thing. Now, with that being said, if you come across the story of a martyrdom like poor St. Isaac Shogues or Father St. René, that you find particularly hard to muster the idea to suffer, you can say this prayer, Lord, this is hard for me to think that I could do this, so I beg you, do not put me to the test. In fact, Christ himself said, pray that you not be put to the test. So you can pray not to be put to the test. There's no shame, and that's a quite a good and humble prayer. But at the same time, if anything comes to your mind, and pick the most contemptible thing, say, Lord, I don't think I, I know that I can't resist these things, but I beg you to give me the grace to give glory to you. By the way, this is directly connected to our faith in the last judgment. In the last judgment, all will be known. And so everybody who's ever suffered an unjust death or persecution, or mar was martyred in secret, and that we never knew their name, all that will be revealed on the last day. And we will be vindicated then. So don't, so take heart, if, if you find this to be a hard thing to, a certain interior uh, repulsion to this, pray to increase, increase your meditations on the last judgment. Finally, and I've added this one, do we make self-persecution our business? People are wonderful, especially our friends, our Catholic friends. And even our enemies seem to be too nice to us sometimes.
But when we make self-persecution our business, when we truly begin to punish ourselves and to make fighting and, and hurting ourselves our, our, our end, we began to really live out the rule where it says deny yourself completely. Prefer nothing to the love of Christ. And so we can ask ourselves, and it's very much in the theme of all the other chapters, is am I making this my business? Do I actually sit down and figure out how will I torture myself today? Now, once again, you're all men under obedience. So you need a blessing for these self-tortures. So bring them honestly to your director. Or if it is, like I said, a matter of the exterior, you can bring them to me. But seek a blessing first. By the way, that self-torture may very well be that you want to do more. And your director, your novice master, says, no. That can be also a torture, too, as a desire to do more for God and not being allowed to. Anyway. So finally, what holds us back? He identifies the following as a want of power in resisting temptation, a following through of penances, and of doing our devout exercises. So if we do not see these things in us, it's simple. Just ask ourselves, we can start examining ourselves on these three matters. And that our three wants, then, things that we should pray for are power, elasticity, and a deeper inner life. And he comes up with three solutions to these. Our need for power or willpower. Better really understood. Flexibility of rolling with the punches. And of course a deep inner life are. Do we have a proper devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary? In our devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary should develop in us a hatred of sin and the acquisition of virtue. In our rule, it explicitly outlines, it says that we desire, in three places it alludes to all three of these interior things, right? It says, we desire to serve our Lord and our Lady. And then it also says, to fight for the rights of God and Christians. And so in this are all these three things, which is devotion to our Blessed Mother, devotion to the sacred humanity of Jesus Christ, and that we have a, um, a devotion to God as our Father. In these three things, more or less is the faith of the lowly, the faith of the humble. It is the faith of being an actual child of God and a brother of Christ and an inhabitant of the home of Nazareth. It is what strengthens us against the temptations of the devil and against the clever words of false religious doctrine of heresy, and of course against our own selves for being in the company of such noble people helps us see what an abased and uh, a sinner that we are. And that when we commit sins or we don't do as we should do, that our wounds personally affect in a human way, our Blessed Mother, our Lord, and God our Father. And so, because I hope you all loved your mothers or have warm feelings or perhaps your wife, seeing her with your children, makes you have these deep feelings. And seeing that in these sins is a, not some type of intellectual virtue thing, you know, where we're in some type of weird um, a game... Uh, but, but an actual human relationship is damaged. On lack of devotion to the sacred humanity of our Lord, we ask, do we have an intense desire for our Lord's glory? A knight who does not have an intense desire for our Lord's glory is not capable of being a knight at all. He has no business of being with us at all. Even the worst one of us, I would think, would have an intense desire for God's glory. If one of you, I mean, even, even the ancient order who had to deal with canons of murder, rape, and sodomy in their disciplinary rule, all the men joined because of an intense desire for God's glory. 
Having an intense desire for God's glory is to be rooted in reason. One doesn't even necessarily need more than like even a human faith to at least know that, well, we should seek to serve God because God is always right. Just to be on God's side and being a God is always right is just plain. That's why the evil one, that's why even our enemies today, the church's enemies in, when, without, always pretend that they're on God's side too. I mean, very few people explicitly and uh, openly worship the beast, although they're growing. Um, when we also have the right um, belief in the sacred humanity of our Lord, uh, it develops an affectionate sorrow for sin. And that when we and we can look into our lives at the times that we've injured our friends or families and the woundedness and the pain that we felt, we need to start weighing these pains that we felt through our past betrayals of human relationships and ask, do I feel a more intense pain for my betrayals of God than I do for humans? We should feel a more intense pain, or at least we should feel the same pain because any offense against our neighbor is also an offense against God. And also, finally, and this is very important, do we put before God our weariness, our disgust, our trials, and do we abandon everything to him? This comes about through that real filial, real belief in the presence of God. Don't forget who you're talking to, of course, when you talk to God. But we do need to, in our own words, or in reciting the Psalter, when we say certain things, very much unite our prayer to them and bear, bear, lay ourselves bare before God and ask for these helps. And finally, on filial devotion to God our Father, this is really a belief in divine providence our ability to see that we're bound to all of mankind and that even our enemies, in a sense, are almost dance partners. That God has allowed them to exist, to see some type of excellence in his saints. God loves a good fight, <coughs> even amongst us. He has saved many people through the example of their neighbor, forbearance or prayers or penance of the saints for sinners. And also that God, who never tests us above what we can handle if we pray and we humble ourselves before him, that he will protect us from all evils that can touch our souls. And as such, God has literally told us to not be afraid of anything in this world. It was the source of David's strength against Goliath. It was the source of Abraham's disposition before God. It was a source of Noah's steadfastness in building the ark and the apostles preaching to the ends of the world. It was what made Lawrence laugh on the gridiron. And so we can laugh too at our enemies, especially now when they think that some economic things are going to bring the faithful to bear. But it is important to remember that as knights who've been called to an exterior witness who God will give particular graces that it may be our lot that we will be the last men standing in areas, or at least that should be our resolution, that no matter what, we will not be the ones that are found unfaithful. In the exterior way. How to understand this is in the life of St. Sebastian, where upon converting many Christians, St. Sebastian sent many of them away into the estates, into the countryside, where they could be hidden and they could be strengthened in the faith because they were not ready for martyrdom, but they did believe. But St. Sebastian and others stayed in the city to be a witness, knowing that it would catch up to them. This YouTube video, our names on a website, our public association with this order may one day be the source of our condemnation before some type of quasi-utopianism. And we have to be prepared for that. But if we love God as our Father, then we know that a great trial means a great crown. And these will give us the grace to see it through if we are faithful 
to our rule, and in particular, the prayer life of our rule, which is the source of all of our graces. So on that note, we've gone for about an hour now. Um, I will... Uh, okay. Um, is everybody... These messages are old, right? The... Uh, okay. Now I will open it up to questions. Um, does anybody have any questions on the chat or on the, the call? Brother, as commander, would you like to add any comments? Brother, do you have any questions? No? Um, Peter, uh, uh, Dan, would you could you just type in if you have no questions to the chat? Okay, so we will um, meet again. Uh, okay, good. Uh, we will meet again, hopefully, uh, this month. I'm thinking um, it'll probably be the... Uh, I'll, I'll talk to Dom Jason since he's the local commander about the date. Um, it'll either be the 24th or the 31st. Uh, for the next uh, portion, once again, you do not need to read ahead uh, to go to the class, but take the book one step at a time. If you have questions later or worries, feel free to contact me and we will set up a time to talk about it. I still owe both of you uh, various things, so please bear with me in patience as I get to addressing those one at a time. On that note, we will end with a Hail Mary. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, one God. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, one God. Amen. Amen.